Namo Buddhaya, Namo Amitabhaya. Hello everyone. So today we'll continue to discuss the life of the Buddha. So we'll talk about the third phase of his eight phases of manifestation. So the third phase is his miraculous birth. So in the previous episodes, we discussed about how he descended from the Tusita heaven and entered into his mother's womb from the right side. And today we're going to talk about his birth. So he entered into the mother's womb from the right side and stayed there for 10 months. And after 10 months, Queen Maya felt the time of birth approaching and her father requested her to return back to his place to give birth. And on her way back, she stopped at the garden of Lumbini, nowadays Nepal. So next year, we'll also go to Lumbini for pilgrimage, the birthplace of the Buddha. So in that garden, there was a beautiful tree called the salt tree or the salad tree. So this wonderful tree was full of lush leaves and blossoms and the scent of its flowers had the most exquisite fragrance. And Queen Maya was so much drawn to it. And Queen Maya walked towards the tree under the shade. And through the power of the Bodhisattva, the tree even bent down to pay homage to the Buddha. So Queen Maya stretched out her right arm and grasped a branch of the tree. And she gazed auspiciously towards the sky. And the Bodhisattva saw his mother was standing holding the tree and he knew this was the time for his birth. So he emerged from the mother's right side, fully conscious and aware. And when he was born, he could walk immediately. And in each step he walked, there was a lotus sprung out from underneath. So this is really a miraculous birth. The Buddha's birth was not like the ordinary birth. At first, there was no pain experienced by the mother. When a woman gave birth, I usually the woman will go through excruciating pain, like the level of pain. Uh, if 10 is the greatest, they have to experience the greatest pain, the greatest suffering when giving birth. And the baby usually came out from uh, below, uh, through the birth canal and with impurities. Uh, this was different, uh, not for the Bodhisattva. Uh, when the Bodhisattva came out, the Bodhisattva emerged from the right side and the mother had no pain, no suffering whatsoever and the mother's right side was also not torn or damaged. Uh, the Sutra says that clearly. And the Buddha could just emerge like that. And when he was born, he emitted great light. So this is really just like manifestation body. Uh, he came out fully conscious, fully aware. So he was untainted by any impurities of the womb. Uh, unlike us, when we were born, uh, maybe our bodies were not so clean. I uh, was usually tainted by all the impurities from the womb uh, because uh, we were born due to ignorance. Uh, we came into this world due to ignorance. Uh, through a thought of ignorance, our consciousness entered into the womb through the birth canal. And when we came out, we also came out down there. Uh, and it's really a place of impurities. Uh, whereas for the Bodhisattva, he entered the womb from the right side, dwelt in the right side, not moved, and exporting the Dharma to the heavenly beings during the mother's pregnancy. And he also emerged from the right side with no pain, no suffering right, for the mother and also for the baby. And he was untainted by any impurities. And when he emerged, he was fully aware, fully conscious, and he walked seven steps towards each of the four directions and through each step there was a large lotus sprung out from underneath. This may sound like a fairy tale. Uh, it's very rare to see that a baby could just walk immediately as soon as he was born. But in 2017 there was a Brazilian baby girl. Uh, the moment when she was born she could also walk immediately and this really reminded us of 
Prince Data. So who knew that the baby girl could also be a manifestation of the Buddha? So it's possible for the baby to walk immediately, right? But we had not heard of anyone who, when they walked, there was a lotus sprung out from underneath, right? But that happened for the Buddha. Right? This is really real. I also recorded in the sutra. And when he was born, there was this great Naga king called Nanda and Upananda. They produced two streams of cold and warm water to shower the Bodhisattva. So when he was born, two streams of cold and hot water I flowed down from the sky to shower the Bodhisattva. And that was why during the Buddha's birthday, we also have a bathing Buddha's ceremony. So this is really to uh, commemorate the event of the Buddha's birth. And as he walked the seven steps towards each of the four directions, on the last step he said, Of all the realms in the world, I'm the most supreme. This is my last birth. I'll uproot the suffering of birth, sickness, old age, and death and I will realize Buddhahood. So when we heard statements like this, I one could feel, oh, he's so arrogant. Why he said he's the most supreme amongst all. So this I doesn't mean the egoistic I. The Buddha had no ego. This I really means the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature of all sentient beings is the most supreme out of all. And we all have that. It's all inherent within us. But for delusions and attachment, we could not realize. So all beings were filled with great joy when the Bodhisattva came into the world. Many inconceivable events happened when the Bodhisattva was born. And seven days after the Bodhisattva was born, Queen Maya died. So some people may wonder why Queen Maya died so quickly after the Buddha was born. So Queen Maya died in seven days and she ascended to the Triastrimsa heaven. And the Triastrimsa heaven, the second level of heaven in the desire realm. So why was that? Because she had already completed her mission. And there was no need for her to stay in the human realm to experience suffering. Because when the Bodhisattva later uh, renounced and took the monastic life, uh, she was doomed to suffer a lot. But there was no need for her to experience that kind of suffering, the suffering of uh, separation from loved one, etc. Uh, she had already carried out her mission, mission completed, and now it was time for her to ascend to the heaven realm and enjoy her blessings. So this was a pattern that followed by all the past Buddha and the future Buddha, where the mother would just pass away seven days after giving birth. And in the Avatam Sankha Sutra, we knew that Queen Maya is actually a great Bodhisattva, and it was her vow to be the mother of all Buddhas. All the Buddhas who were to be born in our world, in the Triculiocosm, Queen Maya will give birth to all of them. So she had already give birth to all the previous Buddha in the auspicious kappa. So in the auspicious kappa, there will be a thousand Buddhas that will be born into the world. Ayanasha Kimoni Buddha is the fourth Buddha. And the next future Buddha will be the Maitreya Buddha. So Bodhisattva, uh, Queen Maya will also give birth to Maitreya Bodhisattva and will also 
pass away within seven days after giving birth. So this is really her vow to be the mother of all the Buddhas in the auspicious kappa in triculeocosm. So Queen Maya is actually a great bodhisattva. So when a Buddha was born, many bodhisattvas and many Buddhas will also come together with the Buddha to play all kinds of roles. Right? Some may play the mother or the father or uh, the arahants, the disciples, or even the enemy like Devadatta. Devadatta is actually also a bodhisattva. Right? In the Lotus Sutra, he also revealed that every Buddha will have his Devadatta to test him. Without the evil, it's also difficult to reflect the good. So all these bodhisattvas come here to play all kinds of roles, like good roles and sometimes even evil roles, like to reflect the good. So this is really like a full play. Like for those who uh, study Mahayana Sutras, uh, you read sutras such as the Lotus Sutra, like the Avatamsaka Sutra, you'll get a more a full image, like a complete image to understand. Wow, a lot of this, they were actually bodhisattvas who come to be, uh, for instance, the Buddha's mother, uh, the Buddha's disciples, and many Arahants who will follow the Buddha. They were also actually Asian Buddhas or even Asian bodhisattvas who come back to be Arahants, had to be the disciples of the Buddha. We'll discuss this more in the future. And later, the Buddha also ascended to the trans streams of heaven to expand the Dharma to Queen Maya, also to repay her kindness. So the sage Asita knew that the Bodhisattva was born as he saw many miraculous signs. So he quickly came to the city of Kapilavastu to see the Bodhisattva. So the sage Asita also had some spiritual power and he could fly in the air. But when he arrived in Kapilavastu, he arrived on foot just to show respect for the Bodhisattva. And when he saw this baby Bodhisattva, he examined the body carefully and he saw the 32 great signs. So if a being has 32 great signs, they could be one of the two possibilities. First, this being could be a Chakravada monarch or a king, so to rule the countries. And second is that this being could renounce the luxury life and to become a Buddha, the Tathagata. And he further examined that the baby also had 80 minor good signs of a great being. So in addition to the 32 great signs, he also had 80 minor good signs. And this only means one possibility, that this baby, when he grew up, he will renounce and he will realize perfect enlightenment to become a Buddha. So as soon as he examined this and he saw this, he started to weep. And King Shuddhana became quite nervous and asked him, why are you crying? The sage said, I was not crying for the Bodhisattva. I'm crying for myself because I'm so old. And by the time the baby grew up and realized enlightenment, I've already passed away and I could not hear his teachings. His teachings were good at the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end. His teachings could eliminate all the sufferings of all sentient beings. He will turn the unsurpassed Dharma, which nobody else in the world can turn. He will bring perfect happiness to the world. His teachings will be unique, perfect, and complete. So he was weeping for himself because he was so sad that he could not hear these perfect teachings because he were already passed away because his marriage was not good enough to hear the Buddha's teachings. So we even have greater marriage than sage Asita. We are still being born in a period where the Buddha's teachings still exist in the world. Although now it's the Dharma ending age and the teachings may be already diluted, but still we have a lot of sutras, we can still have access 
to the Buddha's teachings. And given that at this modern age, it's so easy to find anything on the internet. It's more easier nowadays to gain access to the teachings of the Buddha. So we really have great blessings to be born in this era, to still listen to the Buddha's teachings, to still have the three jewels in the world. But we really have great blessings and we should really cherish the opportunity of listening to the Dharma, to be able to study the Dharma. Sage like Asita, although he had the five spiritual powers, and the divine eye, the divine ear, uh, he knows about other people's mind. Uh, to some extent, he knows about his past lives. To some extent, and uh, not full extent. Only a Buddha can know about the full extent. Uh, he could fly stuff, uh, but he could not eliminate all of his afflictions. Uh, he could not realize enlightenment. Uh, only when one receives the Buddha's teachings, one can realize enlightenment. Uh, to Arahant, to Bodhisattva, the 52 stages of enlightenment, only through the Buddha's teachings, one can cut off afflictions, I cut off attachment completely to realize enlightenment. So it's really, really not easy. Uh, those people who practice externalist teachings, uh, teachings, that's not the Buddha's teachings, they may think they realize enlightenment, but that's not true. Uh, they still have the slightest attachment, uh, which means that sage Asita, although he is a sage with some spiritual power, he's not an enlightened being because he could not encounter the Buddha's teachings. It was really a great pity, but it was also his karma. So not enough blessings to be born uh, in a period where there is the teachings of the Buddha. So we really have great blessings uh, to be born in the period there still exist the Buddha's teachings. So we should really cherish the opportunity to study and to practice the Dharma. And also particularly for those who encounter the Pure Land Dharma, uh, the Pure Land teachings are really the Buddha's teachings. Uh, this is really the teachings by Shakyamuni Buddha. But it's also not easy to believe. Uh, according to the Buddha from the Sutra, uh, this is the difficult to believe Dharma. Uh, very difficult to believe Dharma. Even for a lot of Buddhists, they may believe in some Buddhist teachings like the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path. But when it comes to the Pure Land, they may become quite uh, uh, skeptical. So they are selective in what they want to believe in the Buddha's teachings, although this is clearly uh, taught by the Buddha, recorded from the Sutra. Many people, they recited the name of Amitabha Buddha and they have really seen Amitabha Buddha and have attained rebirth in the Pure Land, like we share many rebirth cases. And also I'm working on a translation for the book called Record of Pure Land Sages, uh, which recorded many many rebirth cases from ancient China to nowadays. So we hope more people can hear the Pure Land Dharma and to name for to recite the name of Amitabha Buddha and to attain rebirth in Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land to liberate from all sufferings in life. Uh, this is the easy path to get out of samsara. You don't need to cut off all your attachment and afflictions uh, you just need to believe in Amitabha Buddha to vow to go to the Pure Land and to practice Amitabha recitation. It's just simple as that. Easy practice, but difficult to believe Dharma. But this is real, really real. Okay, so King Shuddhadana was very happy to hear that his son had all these extraordinary signs. I, his son was not an ordinary being. But he was quite concerned when Asita predicted that the son would definitely renounce and realize Buddhahood and not to stay in the palace to be a king. So he really did not like that and he was quite worried this will come true in the future. And the ministers told King Shuddhadana not to worry and said uh, in the past there were also sages uh, who were very much 
attached to their spiritual practices. But, but if you give them some temptations, they will still fall into temptations. And the minister said, uh, let the prince uh, just experience all kinds of worldly desire and temptations every day. So the prince will not think about renouncing the luxury lifestyle in the future. So King Shuddhadana also agreed and think that yeah, this could be uh, the best expedient mean uh, to really let the prince to indulge in all kinds of worldly desire, worldly pressures, and not to see any sufferings in life. And so in that way, he may not think about renouncing uh, the luxury uh, prince lifestyle. But Prince Siddhartha is obviously not an RAB. Uh, he came here with a mission and he is doomed to renounce and to realize the perfect enlightenment. So in the next video, we'll discuss more about his great renunciation. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Amitabhaya.